and welcome back to Habs Unfiltered, sponsored by Manscaped. This is episode 138. I'm your host, Blaine Pudvang. I'm joined now by my co-host, Treg Wilson. Hello. Uh, our other co-host, Matt Smith, uh, sends his apologies. He could not be here. He is spinning in a chair at work to see how many times he can spin around without throwing up. I think we we had a we had a bet at 50 is when he hits his G-force. And by G-force, we mean that's when he throws up. I don't think he's, he's going to make 50. Yeah. I, what Although if he, the, he's a veteran now, so maybe. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do they get an extra medal if they hit 50? I think it's 100. I think oh. if they can hit 100, they get the, the spinning chair medal. So do, on that metal, can they just can they just spin the metal? Like yeah. is there a little? Yeah. It's the, the, <clears throat> it's hard when force. you mount it though. It's hard when you mount it. Yeah. Well, once it's mounted, even if it's mounted, the little albatross, the uh, the RCAF uh, <laughs> bird, they can spin that on the metal. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That's oh, kind of yeah. cool. So it it's like spinner, cool. like spinner rim, like rims that spin. Yeah, it's the precursor to the fidget spinner. That's where they got the idea. <laughs> Because that's all they do at work is just sit there and spin that little metal. Uh, Canadian Canadian Air Force. <clears throat> Trending. Creating trends. <laughs> Nothing but respect for our brothers and sisters in the Air Force. <laughs> we need rides to where we need to go. So. That's right. Yeah. Especially now where uh, COVID and then the deployed ships, when they come home for HLTA, they have to take a... Uh, a uh, Air Force uh, Aurora, I think they fly on. Or a Challenger jet. Yeah. Yeah, they get a free ride home for their home leave travel. So yeah. that's a great five days at home. Anyway, moving on <laughs> from that, for those who are not in the military and getting bored of listening to that garbage. Um, so we've got a few items. We're going to talk about uh, face-offs. The Calgary series, yes, we are going to cover that. Uh, that is a trigger warning for anyone who's going to be listening. Uh, we'll also talk about some issues with the team, and we'll just go into depth on on the Calgary and Ducharme and the whole enchilada. So to kick it off, we're going to cover a couple little news and notes. Uh, last Yesterday... <clears throat> Saturday, the 24th of April, Sean Farrell became the first player to score 100 points in the USHL since Kevin Roy did it in 2012. So that's a uh, Habs draft pick, Sean Farrell. So not everything is all doom and gloom in Habs land. He also had 72 assists, which is the most assists since 82, 83 season. Yes. Yes. He's, um, He's lighting up the USHL. He was supposed to play in the NCAA this year with Harvard. Uh, they did not, they weren't planning on a season for that school. So he just stayed at the USHL, buys himself another year of eligibility at the NCAA. He'll start school next year. Um, so th this is another one of those long-term projects. He's a, he's either a home run or a miss. It'd be interesting to see how he does in Harvard considering yeah. He was kind of like the big fish in the little pond. and uh, But, I mean, he dominated. He more than dominated. So um, yeah. it's good to see that. It would be interesting to see how he, well he plays in Harvard. And I think that's where the gauge will be at to where he is as a prospect uh, for the Canes. I believe he's a fifth-round pick, Sean Farrell. Late fourth, early fifth, yeah. Yeah, he's uh, a fifth-round pick. Off the top pick. of my head. Um, yeah, no, I'm not saying he's not going to turn out to anything, but let's uh, – cut our expectations down a bit and uh, yeah. celebrate how well he did. And, but you need to realize he was a year older than most people are in the, uh, in, in that development league. Um, so it'll be, if he, if he dominates Harvard or at least does really well, like Caulfield did his first year, didn't really dominate, but he didn't, uh, he was a point per game player. Uh, and the rookie of the year. Yeah. Yeah. You but know, I, I'm, I'm just saying okay. if he, if he can be like a, you know, point per game player, or even a, you know, 0.6 or 0.7 game, you know, like around there, sure. uh, you, I think we got a good guy and we'll see, we'll see what happens with him. He should be, you know, honestly, if he, if he does have a decent couple of years at Harvard, 
that that'll bode well. This is a player that's going to take <clears throat> like Jake Evans, his full amount of time. Yep. Yep. And yes, he is, he is a little bit older than most players in that age, in that, uh, that league uh, normally are because usually they're gone to the NCAA by that point. But this year's a little different. There were a lot of other players in his, mm-hmm. at his age in the league and they didn't do what he did. And there have been players of his age do well in that league in the past, but they didn't do what he did. So, I mean, being the, the first one since 2012 and the records only go back, I think, you know, it doesn't go back that far. And he's one of maybe four players to hit hundred points in that league ever. So that's, that bodes well. It shows that he has that offensive gift. Four years down the line, if he's uh, if he's doing well in the NCAA, he can earn a contract. Maybe he makes the NHL. If he does, great. It's a home run. If he doesn't, it was a mid round pick. Exactly. So, congrats to Sean Farrell, and hopefully everything pans out perfectly for him, and he becomes a superstar NHL player in Montreal. Uh, the next little note uh, today, as we record, it's the 25th of April. It's Sunday. Uh, it is Vladislav Tretiak's birthday. So happy birthday to Tretiak. 19, 1983 Montreal Canadiens draft pick. That's right. Habs legend, Tretiak. So do you, th- do you think he could still, he would still sign with the Canadians? Maybe he can come out. You can't do any worse than what, well, I mean, I, I can't put any blame on the goaltending, but no, no, it's but not like he can, anyway, we're going to get into that later, but I will oh, blame the goaltending yeah. on, uh, on anything yeah. that's going on with the Habs lately. But I mean, Primo had an okay game. He didn't have a great game, but the team played terrible last night. So, you know what, honestly with Primo, I thought he played a very good game overall. He, he was solid. He was for a guy who's only playing in his third NHL game ever, and it's his second pro season, I think he's doing pretty good. I think mm-hmm. he played very well. Uh, a couple of the goals, he had no hope whatsoever of getting. Uh, actually, three of them. That uh, that Goudreau I don't goal. Think, I don't think anything really was bad. Uh, oh. I, th- I think there was one goal there that beat him. You could sit there and say, yeah, he could have had like it. Lucic but- goal? Yeah, but it just beat him. It just beat him. Yeah, it beat him through a screen. He didn't see yeah. anything. He had seven bodies in front of him. So, and I, mean, I think they scored that right off a face-off, wow. which we will get into later. But yeah, I, I think overall he played solid. None of the goals are really mistakes on his part. No, and, and that's what I mean. Like I said, wasn't I misplaced. Think... He was, he was cool. He was calm. He uh, he was he was well positioned. He. Uh, it, it, it looks good for the future is what I'm trying to get at here. He's got, he's got to have to spend a little bit more time uh, developing. He's got to mature a little bit more physically and uh, in his game, but he still looks like a quality NHL starter down the line. Oh, definitely. Uh, I'm not going to take anything away from him for that game. Uh, I thought his first two games were a bit better. Um, but I think the team played better in front of him in his first two games as well last year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I just think last night's game was just a shit show from which the we second definitely period be on. getting into. So, uh, yeah, we'll get into that know. in a little bit, a little bit later, but what we're going to do now is move on to face-offs. There was a little debate yesterday online between yourself and some others where face-offs were seen as, not important or too important. So what and, do you In my defense, I started the conversation as time on ice. <laughs> okay. And, and my, so the conversation went, uh, someone said something about they didn't trust the Dom Ducharme with Kotnyemi's time on ice. They didn't think he would give him Kotnyemi the time on ice that uh, he deserved. Which I can see a, a, a decent basis for an argument. Yeah. I, I can as well. I, I can, but the players that was compared to was like, they kind of suggested that stall was taking minutes away from cotton. You know I, mean? I came out and said, well, based on last night's stats, cotton, Yemi played almost two minutes more than stall and was the third top center in minutes. 
uh, which is he played the third line, so that make that makes perfect sense. And there was only one power play, so he didn't get a lot of power play time. Uh, that turned into a well. I'm talking about the overall progression. I don't trust Dom to share him with his time on ice. He's not given what he deserves. Whereas I replied, well, under Dom Ducharme, he's playing almost two minutes more than what he played with under Claude Julian. So his minutes are coming up. Then it turned into face-offs because then they said, well, you know, Deneau and someone else said something about Deneau and Stahl. When I said, Deneau, he's not out there for time on ice. If he'd win more face-offs, because in the last three games, he's been under, last four games, he's been under 40%, the last two under 20, maybe he'd see more ice time. If his face-offs were better, I think I think that is a valid argument that this coach places a high priority on winning face-offs. Winning the draw. So if you were better at face-offs, you get more time on ice. Correct. Sort of, because Stahl right now is the second best center based on face-off percentage, and he's still playing fourth line minutes. So, but he's taking some situational. But he's taking then. some situational face-offs. Um, so that's how this little discussion went. Uh, I wasn't trying to prove anyone wrong. I was just trying to have a, I was trying to understand the person's thought process and why they went there. Now, if they would have said, I think he should be playing Suzuki's minutes. I think that's a valid argument. I think Cotton Yemi is a better center than Suzuki. Right and now, yeah. He's right playing now. better than him right now. And I think if if someone would have turned around and say, why is Suzuki getting 17 minutes a game to Cotton Yemi's 14, 15 minutes a game, that's a valid argument because really it probably should be based on the play in the last few games, even if you take face-offs into consideration because Cotton Yemi is a better face-off guy than Suzuki, then Cotton Yemi should be getting the 17 minutes and not the, not the it should be reversed um, in my opinion. So, yeah, and it kind of morphed into the whole face-offs. Yeah. Are they important uh, or not? And somebody mentioned that they're not important. They don't need face-offs. It's not important to the game. But when your team important. is it, it yeah, when your team is uh your team concept is based on puck possession. The one area of the game that you can easily improve upon to add puck possession is the face-off. Because if you win the faceoff, you win possession. So correct, it's important, especially in your own zone, late in a game, or in a tie game, or in the offensive zone, or when you need some momentum, or when you just want to start getting whatever. shots on net. Uh, Calgary scored two goals right off the faceoff last night. Montreal scored a goal with Armia the night before, right off a of faceoff. They're important, not just to score goals. Like I'm not saying. But it's a way of getting possession. It's a way of getting shots on net. And it's a way of creating, you have an automatic preset screen. If you win the faceoff, you can get a shot through a screen because all the players are right there in front of the goaltender. It's, it's natural setup. You can have set plays off of the draw. And if you don't have a, a shot, then you can set up in the zone and start a cycle or start a something to get the, you start with possession. Correct. Or if you're in the defensive zone, you can do it. You can get a clean zone exit based on winning the draw. All I got to say is the last few teams that won the Stanley cup have all had guys who drawed 55% to 60% or better. That's right. We don't have a guy like that, but I'm just saying that that's, if you look at past uh, Stanley cup winners, uh, Ryan O'Reilly with St. Louis, um, if you go back to Boston's days, Bergeron was their main center there. Uh, you have uh, Sidney Crosby with Pittsburgh. You got uh, Backstrom with Washington. You got so you have a center who you can put out in any situation, and he's going to win the draw more than he's going to lose it. Yeah, it, they're important. Bottom line: you want possession, you win the draw. You have possession. <clears throat> it's as simple as that. Yeah. Now, that also morphed into how can we be more creative on faceoffs? Yeah, you got you. Yeah, we were talking off air before we started. You had a wonderful idea how to get creative. Uh, positioning your hands and and drawing back better, or just being better than the other guy at face-offs. See, there's no sure. way you can be creative on face-offs. There's absolutely no way. 
you put your best guy out there to win the faceoff, and he either wins it or he doesn't. Yeah. There's there's a few ways of winning a faceoff. It's either having faster reflexes, tying up the other guy's stick and using your foot to kick it back, or tying up the other guy's stick and having the winger come in and kick it and back for kick you. Kick it back, and that's really it. Doesn't matter who the wing. Now, someone suggested in this thread, and we're not naming names, but you can read the thread on Twitter to put Kotniemi on the wing for important draws. Sure. Or on the point. Uh, that, but how does that? I don't. How, how does that win you the faceoff? And yeah. how does that make the faceoff any more creative than Dino going into the faceoff and winning or losing? It gives Kotniemi more ice time. So. What's the point of giving someone more ice time is the ice time is going to be uselessly used. If he's stuck in his own zone? Yeah. And then people are just going to complain that Cotton Amy is always stuck in his own zone. Well, it is, it is Habs Nation, so. But I'm, I'm just, like, I'm, like I get what, like, I, if you're saying, I, late in the game, you always want, for a big draw, you do want to, you would like to have two centers out there in case one gets kicked out of the draw then you still have a guy in there that could could win the draw, right? Like, you've seen that. However, it's usually your two best centers. So unless you want Stahl and Deneau out for every important situational draw, which we don't, then no. that's how that works. Uh, putting Cotton on the wing, that to me, does nothing. Unless you want him to come in, and unless you win the draw, he sees his center position and Dano or Stahl, or whoever took the draw, goes to the bench and makes an immediate change. Or he set as the shooter off the draw. Sure. If he set as the shooter off the draw, perfect. That That's fine. And I can see why he'd be on the point for that, just because he set up as, as a shooter off the draw. But you could also, you know, but if you don't win the draw, now you're left with a offensive guy on the wing, on the point, and he yeah. either got to get off ASAP or he's playing – you're basically playing a power play type defense. Yeah. Something that he's, he's not done because he never plays the point on the power play. So he's not right. He doesn't have the experience or, or the skill for it. So, I mean, and, and overall the face off converse part of the conversation was just a waste of everyone's time because you can only do so much on a face off. You can say, I want it to be creative, but in the end, the face-off is just two people with their heads together and sticks on the ice. Yeah. That's it. That's it. And it comes back to the same thing that we've been talking about for the last three years on this show. The Canadians need to hire a face-off specialist coach. Or uh, sign or trade for a player who's a first-line center that can win draws. Well, and yeah. And- <laughs> I'm trying to remember. They're not the going to do that because they're going to develop Cotton Yemi and Suzuki. So, but I'm trying to remember the name of the assistant coach in Toronto who played in Vancouver. Um, he lost. He lost an eye. He likes eyesight in one eye. Oh, uh, uh, is he on Toronto now? Yes, I'm trying to remember his name. Anyway, while you look that up, I'm going to yeah. go on and say he was he was a face-off specialist. He joined Toronto about a year and a half ago and the Leafs have improved on their face-offs because he is coaching them. Manny Malhotra. Manny Malhotra. There you go. That's there. I had a brain fart. I forgot about it. Forgot his name. I know who he is. So he's a, he was a face-off specialist in his day in the NHL. And since his arrival in Toronto, their face-off numbers have been steadily improving. That's not a coincidence. They're practicing techniques on the face-off that he has developed that helps them. They incorporate their, the, into their game, and it improves. And a team like Toronto, whose entire game is possession, 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 winning the draw and starting on the cycle or getting a quick shot, especially with their shooters, is a massive advantage. The Canadians, for the last few years... <clears throat> have not even bothered trying to get someone to do that. And that's something we've been harping on in this show. Pretty sure Joe really Juno's did. available. Uh, maybe. maybe. I'd say Yannick Perot, but I think he's with something. He's in Chicago. Yeah. He's with Chicago. 
Um, but yeah, if they can bring someone in, I mean, the Canadians don't have the star power of, te- of a team like Toronto, who is top heavy, but they, they base their game on possession. So if you win the faceoff, that's a bonus defensively, offensively, in the neutral zone, no matter where you are on the ice, having the puck is a bonus. But to suggest you need to get more creative on a face-off is you, you can't. No, there's no real creative ways. There's there's like you three can get creative forwards. on the player deployment. Player deployment. We kind of touched on that a little bit. There's not there's not a lot of creativity that can be had. But when it comes to the face-off, a face-off's a face-off. You either yeah. you're good at it or you're not. That's right. <laughs> and if you're not, it would help to have a coach, you know, be there to help. Be there to help you improve. Now, Kotniemi and Suzuki have been improving steadily. kotniemi has been good. Don't get me wrong. Kotniemi, some games he's at 80% and some games he's at 20%. That's the problem with Kotniemi. Yeah. He's, he's very he lacks the consistency right now. And I think that has to do with who he's drawn against. Um, if he's stuck up against like a top center, he's going to lose. If he's stuck up against a not so top center, he's, he's probably going to win. He's at that stage where he's better than most, but not as good as. And those, <clears throat> those top centers have been practicing face-offs much longer. So they have yeah. better technique. They have better timing. This is something, and, and people tend to forget, Kotniemi is only 20 years old. Yes, he's in his third season, but he's only 20 years yeah. old. It'll He's come. still not physically it. mature. It's going to take time, but <clears throat> excuse me. As he practices, he's going to become more consistent on the face-off circle, and we're going to see a much, much improved uh, face-off numbers in his favor. Oh, he'll be a fifty-plus percentage face-off guy. I think so. I think he's going to end up being a sixty to seventy-point center who can win you fifty to fifty-five percent of your face-offs. Yeah play a first or second line depending on whatever's going on and he's a physical guy so i I think he's going to be your top center your one center if suzuki is your two see person that's my personal opinion i think just think suzuki's a little bit further ahead than he is at this moment suzuki's probably going to have better offensive numbers yes but cotton yemi is going to probably be your 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 matchup guy based on his physicality agreed uh, so I think we, we exhausted that. I mean, it's, it's such a, it's, it's an important aspect of the game, but there's not much to it. You know, there's not, it, it's win, lose, no draw. I mean, putting a, another center on the ice somewhere doesn't really make your face off any more creative. No, but if Just, the guy gets kicked out, then you have sure. another center. Sure. It's pretty much it. Which teams have been doing now for 20 years, so. Yeah. Or 30 years or whenever. So, all right. Uh, We'll move on to the Calgary series. Take a deep breath. (sighs) Okay. So, uh, this Calgary series, eh, it's pretty shitty. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the Calgary series in a nutshell, right there, folks. I I don't know what to say. Like Montreal, for some reason, Calgary is the Detroit Red Wings to Montreal's last season. Uh, they just own them. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you right now, and I'm I'm going to show a little bit of bias. Sutter is just out coaching Ducharme in this series. He is and Ducharme but... can't find a way to break the trap and. Uh, or the cycle. Uh, or they, anything. They, <laughs> Calgary likes to trap the hell out of the neutral zone. And once they're in the offensive zone, they, they cycle, cycle the hell out of the puck. They play a heavy yeah. game. They're not fast. They're just always on the puck. They have one guy with no... Uh, the gap control is excellent with Calgary yeah. when they play Montreal for some reason. So they keep a nice tight gap. They're always on that puck. They create the cycle and the Canadians for some reason just can't break that cycle once it's set up in their zone. Um, I, I know there was a couple of times where people are crapping on say Toffoli for not, not getting the puck out of the zone when he had the, when he had the chance that led to a goal in the first game. 
Um, sure, but his his mistake on the blue line was compounded by a mistake down below the the goal line and another mistake in front of the net, all because Calgary keeps the tight gap. They give no time or space. And that that cre- that generates mistakes. The Canadians are are rushing the play, and they they have no response to that style. Well, this has been an issue with Montreal, I think, for a while. Is when they get the puck on their stick in their own zone, they try to rush it out of the zone, and as soon as they try to rush it, they just lose it, or you know, they they lose it. Either the guy they're trying to pass to doesn't know what's coming, and he misses it, and then. The other team, or it just goes right back to the other team. Uh, this is not just an issue with Calgary. This has been a year-long issue with Montreal. There's no, there's every for some reason every time they get the puck in their own zone, there's some type of sense of urgency that they need to get it out right away instead of just trying to protect the puck and trying to find a, the safest way out of the zone. Uh, yeah. Calgary's forecheck, however, forces them to be a little bit try to be a little bit quicker with their, with their passes, because as soon as they get the puck, they're getting a Calgary player just right on them. Yeah. Um, And that's Calgary's game. Uh, Calgary plays a tight, close man to man, tight check game. And they don't leave you for, with a lot of room. They've watched a lot of video. They've watched a lot of video and they know that with the Canadians on their breakouts, they like to go up along the boards. Correct. So they just, they pinch, they block it off. Yeah. So the Canadians and, haven't adjusted to use a second winger or a center to as a second option to come in and maybe make a pass a little bit away, you know, like eh, just on the inside of the face-off dot, you know? Yeah. No well, adjustment. And, and, and they, they're not moving their feet against Calgary. It just seems like they're stagnant. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, when we do get the puck, they just kind of skate to the blue line and wait. Well, that's not what you do. Because as soon as you get the puck, someone's going to be on you and you're going to lose the puck. So, uh, I don't know. Ducharme got to find a way tomorrow night to at least get a win here or things. I mean, I was preaching there for Lau last week that if Montreal plays 500, it's almost virtually impossible for Calgary to catch them, which is true. And uh, uh, Vancouver would have to go like 600 hockey or something like that to, to catch them. But now it's basically Montreal's playing 300 hockey. So if Montreal goes three and seven in their next 10 games. Calgary only has to win five of their nine and Vancouver seven of their 15. So they're the playoffs are in their <laughs> own hands. The Canadians control their playoff destiny. We said this last week when you were, yeah. when you mentioned they had to go 500, they haven't. They definitely have not met that threshold. They don't even, in the last two Calgary games, uh, the first period in the first game was good. The first period last night was good. And then after that, it just seems like they're like, ah, it's like watching Kovalev play. They only seem to be really boosting it up when they want to. And I don't know. There's something, there's something not right there. And I don't know what it is. Well, I, I kind of, made a hint at what I think is part of the problem last night when I tweeted out this team is missing a little je ne sais quoi and it was a picture of Gallagher but that one player shouldn't be they have enough talent on that team that that shouldn't be an issue they do but if you add him to the mix and you'll note that on the ice and I know people are going to crap on people crap on Weber for his leadership or whatever it's not always a team isn't just one leader. A, te- a team is multiple leaders taking uh, picking up the slack at different points in time, and they bring their own strengths to the leadership group. Weber is a guy that commands respect and brings the team together. That, that could be off ice, that could be in the room, could even be on ice at times. But with Gallagher and his consistent, nonstop style of play, he is a le- he's a leader in a follow a follow me by example kind of way, and when the team is starting to dip, and he is still at all times full on hundred percent motor no matter what, it kind of drags other people into the fight. And with him out, they haven't really had that. There's there's no one else like him on this team. 
I, I get that. I'll play a little devil's advocate here. And I get Gallagher. I get the whole, and I, I'm not really disagreeing with you, but we made a team now with enough depth that we should be able to plug and we should be able to have an injury like Gallagher. I mean, injuries are starting to pile up, Drew in and Tartar last night. But with, with the injury like Gallagher, one player, we shouldn't have – someone else should be able on that team to step up and take his spot in a leadership role. That's I, I agree. On paper, home. on paper, I agree. But when the teams – you know, the when the uh, when the morale is a little low during a game and you feel a little bit defeated or you're just a little tired, you, you're like, ah, oh, I'm kind of exhausted at the end of the shift. I mean, I could give that little extra – and maybe get the puck out or I can just dump it or just that little extra, that little extra. If you, if he's on the ice doing all those little extras, you feel you have to, but he's not there. So you don't have that mental, that mental piece in your head. That's pushing you to get that little bit extra. So on paper, I agree a hundred percent. This team shouldn't have any reason why they can't continue to be a 500 team at the minimum, but with, Gallagher out it's those little things especially when you're mentally exhausted and when you're playing as, as much as a team has been lately that does that does have an effect I mean the team is what three and eight with Gallagher out of the lineup yeah that's significant that I mean yeah he's not uh, I mean he is a 30 goal scorer and that that adds a little bit to it. I agree. He brings more to the game than just goals. He, That's he right. brings, he's also that little agitator out there. He's that, you know, he's always talking. He's always smiling. He's always throwing the other team off, throwing the other team off. He's always, you know, talking to the guys on the bench. He's always uh, doing whatever. And they, they do miss that. Um, yeah. I guess my argument is why hasn't anyone else stepped up on the team and done that? I don't, there's not many players like that in the league. But I agree that they should have, in some way, shape, or form, a couple of guys who can step up even a little bit yeah. to fill that gap. Yeah. I, I mean, that's just – I mean, people can blame Weber and the leadership, his leadership, but that's not how Weber leads. That's not his uh, – Although he, the, was, he was pretty, uh, pretty angry. You yes. notice he's got a little bit more of an edge lately? Yeah, he does. And uh, – you know, someone uh, just talking about leadership. Someone didn't like uh, when they asked him about his play and how he said this is a team game. Um, I had no issue with that comment because that's what Weber says every time they address whether he's playing good or playing bad. Uh, and he's absolutely right. There's, I, you read on Facebook and Twitter that uh, Weber should be waived or left unprotected, and Drew Ann should be put on waivers, and he should be you know, kicked off the team and this and this and that. I want people to watch Weber's entire game, not just point out the mistakes that he made, but I want you to watch the entire game and watch Weber the entire game. Yeah. He's making mistakes. Yeah. He's a little bit slower, uh, but he is an effective person on that bench in that dressing room and on the ice. Uh, does his minutes need to be reduced? Yes. Yes, they do. Uh, definitely. He should not be the top defenseman. For no, the no, God, no, no, no. Uh, so I will, I will say that, but to sit there and say that he needs to be left unprotected or waived or off the team, that's just ridiculous because uh, you're obviously not watching the entire game and you're obviously just wanting to pick out the bad things that Weber does. If you look at a goal that's being scored, Yes, that player made a mistake, but you know what? So did that player, and so did that player, and so did that player. A goal this player more than just one error. A goal Correct. is usually two to three errors in a, in a play. And unless Weber threw the puck out front of the net right onto the stick of a guy coming down in the slot, or any player, you can't really pin it on one. You could look at that one play and say, man, if you would have done that. But then you can go 30 seconds before that and say, well, this guy would have done this, or that guy would have done that. Right. So maybe I just look at hockey different than other people. Um, but I don't like the pointing fingers at one person and saying that they're the person that's bringing this team down because it's not the way it is. On that, I'd like to point out in the Edmonton game, <clears throat> Anderson's second goal, Archibald on the half wall down by the goal line, wanted to do an outlet pass to nurse to clear the zone. 
Nurse wasn't quite in the position he normally is because he was a little bit ahead of the play to where Archibald thought he would be. And Archibald tossed it out in front of the net. Anderson was there, taps it in. Goal. Habs fans were ecstatic. Oh my God, what a great goal. But that was a mistake made by Archibald. And you could even say nurse a little bit. Yeah. But a goal is normally the cause of an error. <clears throat> and those Correct. errors are born from forcing plays by for, uh, cutting out time and space. And that is exactly what Calgary has been doing this entire series. Exactly. Forcing Montreal to make unforced errors and they're capitalizing on them. Montreal's not doing that against Calgary. Montreal's sitting back waking, waiting for Calgary to make a mistake so they can jump on it, which is the wrong thing to do. So, yep. I mean, I don't know if we're going to get into this later, but oh, actually we are going to get it, so I'll, I'll wait till then. But uh, I was just going to say that goes into coaching, but I think we're going to talk about Yeah, we're coaching. going to cover coaching yeah. in a little bit. Um, for the Calgary series, there's one more game to be played. It's on Monday night. Uh, the Canadians really need that win. That is, that is about as much win as you can get in a regular season. They have to have this one. Just Not just so that they can get that six-point lead back, because right now they're only four points up with a game in hand. They win that next game. They're six points up with a game in hand. They got a little bit more breathing room. But it's, it's not just about that. It's about confidence. It's about proving to themselves that they can actually win those types of games. Because Bergevin at the start of the season said, hey, we got a team that can win any way you want. Where is that? Well, and that's... Yeah, again, this gets into other stuff. But I mean, Montreal, even their body language, their body language again, these last two games since Calgary, like in there, in the after post-game interviews, we're in our own heads. We got to go and try harder. We get. Yeah. So part why aren't you of, doing it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You paused a little bit there. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so we missed a couple of, uh, a couple of seconds, but yeah, it, for the most part, they're in their heads. They are in their heads. And uh, Weber mentioned it when uh, he said the team needed another practice on their day off because they felt they play better because they work through things on the ice during practice. Well, they didn't. It worked for them in Edmonton. It did. It did. It's not working right now in Calgary. Did they have they had a practice that they can shake some stuff out on? I'm not sure. I I, I can't I can't really say. I'm not in that room. I I don't know. I do believe that shows the dedication that the team does want to win. It does, and it but, does show that there there are some injuries. There are uh, there there's bumps. There's bruises. People are tired mentally and physically but they have to find a way to get past that so they can get some of these wins. This, this, you can blame, game, this next game is important. You can blame the schedule all you want, but uh, they have to find a way to win either way. And they win. They still got to win. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like face adversity and overcome it. But you have to know what you're facing. So you mm. have to understand that. Yes, you are physically fatigued. You are mentally fatigued. You have, bumps you have bruises there's a couple injuries to the roster knowing that good you, now you have that you know it now what the hell are you going to do about it what are you going to yeah. do to get past that that's the key here it, it's it these are this is where the intangibles start to come into play you know everyone talks about well this guy on paper that guy on paper well these are the intangibles and this is why I point to Gallagher as that, that spark plug, that way to get through there because his intangibles, he's more than the sum of his parts. I mean, he's five foot, nine, five foot nine, 185 pounds. You wouldn't guess that this is a guy that can score 30 goals in the NHL, but there he is. Another key part to that is the Canadians are in the bottom third for generating shots from the slot. Gallagher lives in front of the net he generates all his shots from within a foot of the goaltender whether he be inside the net or outside the net doesn't matter he's in front of that goalie the canadians need more of that all their goals the last two games against calgary have come from 
two feet from the net, but they're not getting enough shots from the slot. If they want to win this next game, they need to have a dedicated effort to go to the net. Well, that's, they, that haven't, they haven't done that in the past any game against Calgary. No, no. one's going to the net. Even, even their power play. Their power play, they just pass it around the outside. Do, 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 do. Except the <laughs> power it. play goal that they got last game that came kind of off the rush. Right. Perry made a beautiful, beautiful no-look tap pass across the crease to Toffoli, who was a foot out from the net. But Perry was right there in front of the net. This is how they generate their goals. Yeah. Suzuki's goal. He's, he scored on his own rebound a foot away from the net. This is how you score goals in a playoff style atmosphere in the NHL. You need to get to the front of the net. If they can do that, they'll have success, but there, there's a price to be paid to get there, especially against Calgary. You're and you're absolutely right. Monday night's game is a must win in my mind, a must yes. win. Cause if you have that six point gap and you've got that win in hand, Confidence goes up. If you lose, they're two points back. That that's a significant gap. Yeah, that's a big swing. Uh, so uh, I think we pretty much covered everything with the Calgary series. Um, we'll we'll talk a little bit about coaching here, but first let's talk about a different type of coaching. Manscaping. Habs Unfiltered is sponsored by Manscaped the global leaders in men's below the waist grooming manscaped offers precision engineering tools for your family jewel and is now available in the U S Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and the EU. We have an exclusive offer for our audience. Use code unfiltered 20 to get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. Join the movement and the other 2 million men who trust manscaped. Did you know one guy every hour, every day is diagnosed with testicular cancer. So this is a reminder to all the men listening to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Manscaped, in addition to providing the right tools and solutions for safe and easy manscaping, has partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to spread awareness for men's health and early cancer detection. Together, TCS and Manscaped are committed to raising awareness for the most common form of cancer in men, aged 15 to 35, and giving support for fighters, survivors, and families impacted by testicular cancer as part of their We Save Balls initiative. While you're down there cleaning up your sack, why not go ahead and give them a little investigation for lumps, changes in size, or any pain? I think we can all agree it's pretty fun playing with your balls anyway. Manscaped recommends you check yourself once a month. If you do feel any lumps or swelling, give your doctor a call immediately. In addition to checking yourself regularly, you want to make sure you st- your sack is looking fresh and clean with the Manscaped Perfect Package 3.0. Inside the perfect package, you'll find products and liquid formulations that have been developed to turn your bathroom into a salon for your balls. All liquid formulations use only the best ingredients. Some of these liquid tools include the Crop Preserver, an anti-chafing deodorant for your balls, the Crop Reviver, a spray-on ball toner and refresher. The Perfect Package 3.0 also includes anti-chafing performance boxers that keep your package cool and smelling fresh. Join the Manscaped movement and start taking care of your balls today. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code unfiltered20 at manscaped.com. Always use the right tools for the job. Get 20% off plus free shipping with code unfiltered20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with code unfiltered20 at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. So yes, uh, as someone who has been impacted by testicular cancer, I must reiterate the importance for young men, hell, old guys like myself, keep checking yourself. Always check. You never know. It's important to catch this early. If you catch it early, everything's fine. You can so, do it with your partner. It could be fun. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. You can make a game of it. Mm either with someone or on your own either way either way could be fun but yes definitely be sure to check yourself this is a this is a very serious thing testicular cancer is serious it's it is one of the leading causes of can one of the leading cancers in men so please check yourself 
And also, you mentioned uh, Manscapes in Australia. Just let everyone know we are the top-rated Habs podcast in Australia at the moment. It's also in the EU. Don't don't we do pretty good there too? Finland. Yeah, we're one of the top-rated ones in Finland. There you go. Just saying. Just throwing it out there. Sisu, to all my French friends, Sisu. I have no idea what that means. It means live life to the fullest. <laughs> you better stop watching Habs games. <laughs> well, no, where I gr- where I grew up, there's a large Finnish community, so I always heard that saying. And there was always there was always a sauna and a snowbank in the winter. Uh, don't tell Connor McKenna you grew up in their uh, community of Finnish people. Oh yeah, no, the hate <laughs> hate for him to make a an angry tweet about me. <laughs> How would I ever recover from that? <sighs> yeah. <sighs> Anyhow, we're going to move on now to the next topic, coaching. You had quite a bit to say about coaching because you are a massive Dominic Ducharme fan. I was. Uh, I... <laughs> I don't know of a Dom's just disappointing me. Like I expected him to bring a totally different style to the game. I expected it to be more offense. Actually, I expected it to be the offense better, the defense worse. Um, and we're not getting any of that. Um, it just seems like he tweaked a couple things. And other than that, he's just copying what he learned from Terry in the past two seasons. And, uh, it's disappointing. I, I expected. You mean Julian? Julian, yeah. Well, yeah. Terry and Julian, same person. Um, <laughs> Julian doesn't yeah. smoke. Yeah. True. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just, I mean, I will say he, he's given a little bit more ice time to Suzuki and Cotton and me. He's letting the young guys get some, but uh, he's not making the moves. It's almost like he's going by the analytics and only the analytics and. I don't want to say that. Well, that's, that's kind of a wrong statement, but I uh, mean for Weber, there's no way Weber should be on the top pairing and armchair GMs and coaches have been saying that and they're not wrong. I don't normally agree with arms, but I mean, I've coached teams, you've coached teams. Any coach can look at a guy and say, you know what? He's still got stuff to bring, but you know, I got to cut his minutes down. Um, and that's what you got to do with Weber. Uh, is he afraid of Weber? Uh, I mean, I know there's a conspiracy going on that uh, Bergevin has got his hands in it and he's forcing Dominic Ducharme to play this guy here and that guy there. And I think that's total bullshit. Um, Bergevin wants to win. His job's on the line. He wants to win. I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't think his job is going to be lost this season. I don't either, but he's in the hot seat. Let's put it that way. Yeah, he is. But he's been in a All hot right. seat for what? Since day one. Uh, I, I don't think he he's going to lose his job either, whether they make the playoffs or not, because I think Bergman has a plan and he's the plan's progressing the way he wants it to progress, whether they win or not. Um, although, anyway, that's another topic. Well, but I, I don't know. People expect last year this team was in the play, it was in the play ins only because they wanted the the top two television markets on in the Chicago, NHL to make Chicago it. and Montreal. That's right. So they yeah. make it in based on that alone. So this wasn't a playoff team last year. This year, they're they're a playoff bubble team. So what's where's the surprise? Where's what do you expect? There's been progress. That's what I tweeted this morning. I tweeted this morning that, and I think I said this earlier, or maybe we said it offline. I don't. I understand have fans. And I understand your anger. I get it, right? Yep. But this team is exactly where we everyone thought they would be when the season began. Which is exactly why I don't where. think. Which is why I don't think his job is on the line. And I don't either. Like everyone wants him fired, but they've wanted him fired since either 2016 or before. So yep. uh, whatever. And if you look at his overall work. It's almost like, I mean, we're getting off coaching, we're getting into the GMing, but if you take Bergevin, you got to cut him in half and pretend he was two different GMs. First five years, he was Bergevin 1.0, made a lot of mistakes, didn't build around the core that he had to make a true contender. 
right? Yeah. Uh, and then, then, then you got Berger, except in 2015 there when they probably would have went to the Stanley Cup Finals if Price didn't get hurt. Um, but they made it to the ECF. And then you got to look at Bergevin, the rebuilder. The, 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 the Bergevin 2.0 was the GM that replaced the old Bergevin and said, okay, we got to start here. Now, valid argument. He should have made a complete overhaul and started rebuilding right from the scratch. That's a valid argument. Valid. I get that. Sure. Although I don't think he did it wrong. I really don't. No. And which brings us to the coach now. He's the right. interim head coach. He's got a record of 11, 12, and 5 since he was brought in as the interim head coach. And he should not be brought back next season. My my problem is he was supposed to come in as one of the new age coaches. One of the new age, you know, we're going to open things up. We're going to make things more modern. And he's not. He hasn't. But is that really on him or on what Bergeron has given him? Because the new age coach relies heavily on on puck moving defensemen uh looking at the blue line that the canadians have he doesn't exactly have a wealth of puck movers no he doesn't but if he distributes them correctly and maybe put because you have a puck mover in petrie yeah you have a puck mover in kulak romanov could be could be classed a puck mover he He, he he, is yeah he's a puck mover but then you put charat and weber together and he keeps charat and weber together Put yeah. Roman, put split them up. And I mean, I'm old school, so I'm the stay at home with the puck mover. That's your line. You have a stay at home defenseman, a puck mover, stay at home puck mover. Maybe your third line, you can have two stay at home guys who can, you know what I mean? You're they're only getting 12 minutes a game anyway. Um, but switch Sherratt and Weber up now. You have Merle, Merle can move the puck, he's not your prototypical puck mover, no. Uh, uh, and then you got Gustafson, who can move the puck. The problem is he can't do anything else. So well, he did uh, get two assists last night. He did, but that's what a puck moving defenseman does. Yeah. So, uh, you know, switch it up. I, I I don't like the fact Kulak's not in the lineup. Uh, no, no, he was playing really well before he got set aside so that they can make room for Merrill to play. And the same with Evans. Evans was playing really, really well. He got set aside for Stahl to make room for Stahl to play. And Stahl's been terrible. So yeah. that this is what my problem was with Ducharme. You're, you're, you're like you just said, you're the modern day coach that's supposed to make modern day things, but you're not setting your lineup to work at a modern day plan. Well, yeah. And on defense, there's issues there, but at the same time, um, there has been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of argument about the mismanagement of the recalls, and with three of them already used up, only one remaining. They're relying on the emergency recalls due due to injuries. So there's uh, he doesn't have as much of a choice on who to deploy and how when it comes to dressing certain players, especially up front. Um, I agree he's with got, that. he's been playing a seventh defenseman because, you know, calling up, uh, Caulfield, they don't have the cap space for it. Uh, Evans. Yeah. And Evans was playing last night only because Byron was out with an injury. So they needed to do an emergency recall of Evans and he played extremely well. Evans did. So it, it's a bit of a combination of. He's kind of handcuffed, but he's not very creative in how he is dealing with that problem. And that's what I, I, I'm getting at. Like we, we, like you made a good point. The modern day coach relies heavily on a puck moving defenseman. He has puck movers. They're not your prototypical. Other than Jeff Petrie. Other than Jeff Petrie. Jeff Petrie can move the puck, uh, but he's not deploying them like he should. Like you have Kulak sitting on the bench or up in the press box. You yep. have. Like Weber should be paired with, I wouldn't even mind Weber being paired with Gustafson, to be honest with you. Um, At this point. Yeah. You know, cause Gustafson can move the goddamn puck. I, I cringe every time we're in our own zone, pinned in our own zone and he's out there, but <laughs> you know what? For a puck, you take that with a puck mover. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of puck movers who aren't Subban. Subban wasn't very good in his own end, better than Gustafson, but he wasn't very, you know, he, he wasn't, yeah. Carlson, there, Eric, there's Eric warts Carlson. to their game. There's warts to their game on defense. That's right. 
Eric Carlson was not a good defender. It wasn't terrible, but his offensive game made up for everything. His possession game made up for everything else. The the overall entirety of their game, you're you've got a positive outlook on their game because the offense outstrips the defensive Defense. issues. Gustafson, not so much. But anyway, his offense is just a little. But the problem with that yeah. is Gustafson is a bottom pairing guy. Correct. Whereas we're looking at some, we a need for someone to play in the top pair. So you put Merle, you put Merle alongside Weber. You put yeah. Kulak alongside Weber. Kulak? That's who I would like to be yeah. by Weber. And then you can put Sherratt on the four, third pairing and you can rotate Merle and Gustafson as you see fit. And you can rotate in different pairings based on situations. I mean, Sherratt yeah. and Weber are amazing, uh, an amazing okay. shutdown pair at the last minute of a game, <clears throat> last minute of a period. The Canadians are constantly sure. giving up goals at the end of a period. Throw them out there, there. There's nothing stopping you. Just because you set your pairs or your lineups before the game starts, there's nothing stopping you from switching them in the game. That's right. Based on line covers. Now, when it comes to Caulfield and that getting in, I know people are getting mad at Bergevin for the call-ups and all this kind of stuff. Um but he's kind of he was kind of handcuffed as well. Kind of handcuffed. I, I don't really agree with you. Let call up because I think they had uh, defensemen there. You didn't really need them. They really um, wanted to get rid of Mete, so they they waved Mete and used a call up. Yeah. And that's that's what you end up with. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of people are saying just use the last one, but it's money now. It's not a matter of they need to use the last one. It's the matter of they don't have enough room because of. Uh, Caulfield signing bonuses and all that kind of stuff uh, yeah. to, to throw them in there. It's You need 1.3 million. I think they only have 357,000. So. so now if Primo, who they guaranteed a game to. Uh, Gets sent Pre- down. Well, they can put Primo on the taxi squad, bring yeah. Lindgren up as the backup to dress because Allen's going to start the game tomorrow. Right. Lindgren can be his backup. And then they and can bring Caulfield in. Then you can bring in Caulfield. Yeah. So, which I think is what's going to happen. I think, I mean, throw the kid in. Listen, Caulfield's not the savior. No, Caulfield's not. So whoever is saying, I'm excited to see him. Do I expect him to score a hat trick? No. Do I expect him to score a goal? No, not really, to be honest with you. I no, like him he to could. score a goal. I his, think he could. No, no, he could. I, yeah, no, but his, uh, his um, dressing him could make the power play that much better. Yeah, even if he doesn't score, could put a spark on the team, which is what the team needs right now. Yes, exactly. Um, So, but I I I like to temper my expect. That's all because I don't want to go in there thinking this guy's going to be. This kid's not going to solve all their issues. This kid's not going to be filling nets. He's not Zadina. He's not going to fill nets. (laughs) But they need offense, and he's an offensively gifted player. That's right. Put him out there. It's not going to hurt the team. Throw him on the power play, and just his, just him being on the power play as a weapon forces the other team to open up some ice because they have to cover him now. So that opens up someone else for a chance, at the very least. At the yep. best, he he reenacts what he's done at every friggin' level he's done it in his entire life, and he puts pucks in the net create some offense in some way, shape or form. And that's, that is essentially what the Canadians need. Even if he's not scoring the goal, if he's somehow creating plays and he likes to create plays in that slot area. Yeah. Cause as a goal scorer, he knows this is where I score most of my goals. So, and it, it, yeah. it, and this will go back to Dom Ducharme and how he deploys yeah. him as well. If he's going to throw him out on the fourth line, then you might as well not even dress him. Exactly. In my opinion. Don't exactly. even dress him if you're throwing him on the fourth line. Third line with KK, sure. Second line or Suzuki line, whatever. Whatever line you put him on, as long as it's not the, the fourth line, you're wasting your time. And if he's not on the power play, you're, 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 you're wasting an opportunity there too. And that's on the coach. I'm not saying Dom's not going to do that. I'm not saying whatever. I don't know yet. We'll see when he puts him in there. But Well, with – with Dominic, like we talked, we talked about a little bit. He's he doesn't have a transition game. He's relying too much on those stay-at-home guys. Mm-hmm. So, a team that's built on speed, a team that's built on scoring off the rush, you need that transition game. And there's no transition game. We've talked about this as well throughout the show, 
and I've harped on this for years, they're not getting enough shots from the slot. They're not attacking the net. There's no net front presence, steady net front presence. I mean, at times, yes, but it's not consistent. And But you need also, just to reiterate, yeah, you need a puck mover who can create offense with the transition game. So, because yes. I know people will say, oh, we had Mete. Mete only had a transition game. Once he got into the offensive zone, 80% of the time the play died. It was a black hole of offense. Right. Uh, yes, he had some good rushes. Yes, he had some good plays, but they were too far and too few in between. And you need a puck moving like, like Petrie, who can get the puck into the zone and set up or at least create some type of offense. That's what you need. Now, Gustafson, uh, with all his faults, can do that. scored pretty high on the zone exits and zone entries as well. Yeah. He's got two points in two games, and that's just in his time in Montreal. He has done exactly he has done better than Mete has ever done offensively and defensively. Well, on the zone exits, you know what I mean? Yeah. So he's he's got that advanced stat check in the box. He's got a couple of points. Mete in 17 games with the Canadians last year scored three points. Three. For a guy this, who's supposedly a yeah. yeah. So for a guy who's supposedly a puck mover and generates offense, three assists in 17 games. Even on the third line, I, I know that the argument is well, he's not really given the best players to play with. But another was Gustafson. And Gustafson was able to d- get two points in two games. Yeah, but Blaine, you're just looking at the regular stats that don't matter to anybody anymore. You're not looking at the advanced stats that Mete killed the league in. Well, I'm, I'm looking also at the zone exits and zone entries. I'm just saying. I'm Which just is saying. Mete's only strength. Mete's a great transitional defenseman. But he's not able to... He's not good defensively. In, and he's not good offensively. He doesn't generate enough points. He, he is going anything. to be, he is what he is. He's going to be a guy that can play 12 to 14 minutes a game on a third pair and be used as a seventh defenseman. That's, that's his career. I'm really going to piss off the Met Day cult here. And I'm going to say he's a poor man's Gustafson. Am I wrong? Tiger 28 now, bastards. Am I wrong? No. Um, <laughs> no, really no. Um, not. So, yeah, so there's not enough net front presence. There's not enough transition game. Uh, there's also a lack of an elite scorer star power, which people think Caulfield's going to bring. Maybe eventually, maybe. He has the pedigree to bring that. He has the potential to do it. Yes. The potential's there. Now, we got to wait and see, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. He's not going to just walk in and become Ovechkin. You know what I mean? Like, it's not going to happen. Um, yeah, he is. Did you see what he did in Laval? Well, yeah, I watched those games. They were fun. Uh, why can't he? should be able to do that much. He's the best Montreal Canadiens player right now. I can't argue that. I, I just, I, I'm reading this on Twitter. He is the best Montreal Canadiens player right now. I mean, I'd like to argue against that. He but... will have 30 <laughs> goals by the end of the season. He's going to average three goals a game. For the next 10 games. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> if he did that, if he did that, I would. Oh. I'll buy a, I'll buy a Victor Mete Ottawa Senators jersey and wear every episode. I will do the same. If he scores 30 goals by the end of the season. You know what? I'll, I'll even knock it down to 20. I will build, I will build <laughs> a, a golden idol of Mete. <laughs> I will never say anything bad about Mete ever in my life again. I'll just, he's the greatest defenseman that ever lived. Well, the only thing I say about Mete. You'll start a new Mete fan club if uh, yeah. Caulfield scores 30. But uh, now I really want to see it. I want that to happen. <laughs> Behind me, instead of this Montreal symbol, just be a big face of Mete. <laughs> oh, it's from the Fatheads. You get order that in from <laughs> Fatheads. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I think we pretty much covered everything we were going to talk about. Uh, I just like to, I'd like to, just give a little two cents. Habs fans, look, look at me, look at me. 
Don't do it. It's okay. The team is where we thought it was going to be. I agree that we should be upset that they're backing their way into the playoffs instead of making their way. But remember, it's just hockey. There are more important things in life. Focus on that. And then when it comes game time, then shit all over the team if you want to. But take a break, regroup yourself, and take care of yourself and your family. And then when it, when it comes time, remember hockey's a distraction. It's, it's for fun. Whether you want to <clears throat> use that time to, you know, tear people apart uh, on the, you know, tear the team apart or complain about the team. If that's, if that's the way you, you deal with it, that's great. But take a break from it. Even if you're super happy about the team, for some reason, I can't really explain. But if you're really, really happy about the team, take a break from it and do something else and then come back. That's, I just want to, I just want to put that out there. I, I've, I feel everyone's pain and joy. And I just want you guys to be happy and healthy because our listeners are what make this fun. Trey. Just, let's just be realistic about things in life. Um, we're in a pandemic. Nova Scotia's getting locked, got locked down sort of again. Thanks to uh, a few Ontarians from a red zone. Uh, you know, I mean, I had to take my dog yesterday to the emergency. She has vertigo and in her ear issue. She's 13. So anything time we got to rush a dog of that age, especially her size, she's a lab, uh, you know, so, but you got to put things in perspective. Uh, the Montreal Canadiens, did we want, I, I had him pegged to finish third in the, in the, in the division. Uh, but uh, I also, when we see everyone putting out their things and, you know, Toronto was going to have 102 points and, you know, Montreal was going to battle for seventh. Some people had it, but uh, we realistically, this team was a, at best wild card team in a regular season at best fourth place in the North division um, at best third, but you know, settle for, for fourth uh, the way they're doing it now. Yes. I totally agree. They, all they had to do was maintain a 500 record and they would have easily slid into that four spot. And, and there's still time for that. And there's still time for that. They have 10 games left. Calgary has nine uh, Vancouver has 15. So win four games and you're in. Exactly. Win, f- go four and six, and you're in. That's not ideal. I'd rather them go nine and one, eight and two, seven and three. But uh, if they do that, they might catch third. As a matter of fact, only five points out of third. But yeah. uh, just be kind to each other. Everyone has different opinions. I know I can come across as crass, and I'd, I'll be you? honest. You <laughs> really? I'll be honest. I've kind of been quiet on Twitter lately. I don't know if anyone's noticed. I pop up every once in a while to say something but uh um yeah just take it in stride montreal i i'm not gonna make a guarantee but i'm pretty i'm confident montreal is going to get that four spot in the playoffs and then we'll see what this team really is uh we've been saying all year long that this is a playoff built team built for the playoffs uh we'll see when they play winnipeg in the first round when winnipeg takes over toronto in first which i don't think is going to happen but anyway <laughs> Although so we'll I would see. love to see a Montreal Winnipeg series, that would be nice. I'd, I, you know what? I don't mind a Montreal Toronto series, and it could go either way. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Montreal Toronto for me, our best best save for the second mm-hmm. round, so that we can have King of the North memes. That that Toronto already has those. It's it's obviously Matthews. Sure. Obviously, you know nothing, Treg Wilson. <laughs> obviously not. <laughs> all right so i'd like to end the show there i want to thank everybody for listening everybody for following us on twitter instagram facebook uh check us out on youtube uh, habs unfiltered youtube if you if you subscribe to our youtube channel and you're one of the first 200 subscribers you could win yourself a terry ryan fights film and folklore book we will send to you so once we hit that uh, our magic number we will pick two people 
you'll win a you win that prize. So keep the loser listening. gets a topless picture of me. I apologize to everybody in advance for that because that's you. Anyway, um, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Thank you for following. And remember, if you are talking about it, so are we. <laughs>